Hey everybody, it's Shaman Sister Sin, and I just wanted to talk to you for a few minutes about narcissists and magic tricks. You know, one of the biggest reasons no contact with narcissists is recommended so strongly is because your brain tends to believe what your eyes and your ears tell it, even if this contradicts known facts. Consider magic tricks and optical illusions. The reason people like them so much is because their eyes and their ears are telling them that it's real, even though their brain knows that it's not. This is what happens when you are around a narcissistic personality, except magic tricks are harmless and this relationship is not. One of the most common things people say regarding these relationships is that they're trying to internalize the information they have learned about narcissistic personalities, but they're having a really hard time and they feel very confused. Almost without fail, these are people who are still in the relationship in some way. This is one of the reasons no contact is so important. It's not possible to come to acceptance when there is conflicting information being thrown at you constantly. What you know does not match up with what your eyes and your ears are telling your brain, and the result can be massive confusion. Your brain tends to rely on your eyes and your ears, which results in believing the magic trick even though you know it's not real. Believing in a magic trick for five minutes at a magic show is harmless. Being unable to accept the reality about a predatory relationship is not. Going no contact stops or reduces the constant influx of contradictory information so that you can focus on accepting what you know to be the reality of the situation rather than exhausting yourself trying to incorporate and process conflicting information where it doesn't fit. The narcissist's self-portrayal often does not match up with what you know to be the facts about them, and in many ways, this is absolutely deliberate. Accept this as a reality and stop trying to make sense out of it. It's never going to make sense because it is directly and deliberately contradictory. The way to stop the confusion is to get out of the situation. There is no way you can become educated enough about something to be able to completely disregard what your eyes and your ears are telling your brain. This is not going to happen. It's how your brain works. The confusion will end when the contradictory information stops. So I hope that clears a few things up for you. As always, I look forward to your comments, questions, and suggestions, so please keep those coming. I take appointments online over the phone, via text, via messenger, via email, and through Skype worldwide. So if you're interested in speaking with me one-on-one, -on -one, you can visit littleshaman.org to do that, as well as see what workshops, seminars, or clinics we are offering this month. Also, we have a support group that we are doing starting in January. It's called the Sacred Healing Recovery Group. If you're interested in that, you can find out about it on littleshaman.org as well. You've been listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by BetterHelp.com and LittleShaman.org. That's me, Little Shaman. May the Great Spirit bless you. Have a beautiful day. Hey, everybody. It's Shaman Sister Sin, and you're listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by BetterHelp.com and LittleShaman.org. That's me, Little Shaman. Today, I wanted to talk to you about something that is really common when dealing with narcissistic people, and that is the idea that we can become educated enough to deal with narcissists and not be harmed by the relationship. This is a mistake that many people make, so I thought we could talk about it on the show today. When you're dealing with narcissistic loved ones, it may have crossed your mind that educating yourself about the dysfunction could be a viable way to preserve the relationship. Yes, they are toxic, and yes, they are hurtful, but if you can learn how to defeat or circumvent that, you can continue the relationship. It doesn't have to end. You can learn to deal with them and fortify yourself enough to where the relationship does not harm you. The problem with this is it's not true. Understanding narcissism does not protect you from the damage of dealing with narcissists. If you are around a narcissist all the time, you're not going to be able to protect yourself from this damage. It is intrinsic to the interaction. Even if you learn not to take things personally, this is still the case. 
Our brains function a certain way, and they will continue to function that way for the rest of our lives. You will continue to try to be understood and heard by this person. You will continue to try to interact with them the way you interact with every other human being. You will continue to try to have your reality validated. You will continue to try and reason with them. You will continue to try to bond and reach out, and it will all continue to fail. The reason is because regardless of how much you understand, there are certain things that have to happen in order for humans to interact and communicate with each other. These things do not happen with narcissists, and understanding why they don't happen does not change anything when it comes to the nuts and bolts of dealing with another person because they still just don't happen. Educating yourself cannot change that, and it doesn't somehow make this not a problem anymore. You will continue to project onto the narcissist in your life and fill in the gaps for them because you won't be able to help it. Narcissists have big blank spaces where things like empathy and a basic understanding should be. And assuming these things are there is essential for humans to be able to interact with each other. Your brain makes this jump automatically and it will continue to do so because it's responding to your eyes and your ears telling it that you're dealing with a functioning adult person even though you're actually not. You may intellectually know that, but it's very difficult to override your brain's built-in reliance on your eyes and ears, especially if you're around this person all the time. The fact that they are not out of control, crazy, cold, silent, or whatever way they're horrible all the time is all it really takes to fool your brain into believing that they can be interacted with in the same way as everybody else, because sometimes they can be. This is one of the many reasons we say no contact is the only real option. Your brain is simply not going to be able to deal with the contradiction. It will continue to make the same assumptions it always makes, and it will continue to be wrong. This is unavoidable, and you're not going to be able to intellectualize your brain out of doing it. It will continue to happen, and it will continue to cause pain and problems. Understanding narcissism and educating yourself about narcissists also doesn't somehow make it possible to successfully coexist with a person who lives in a completely different reality than you do. Knowing this is happening and why doesn't change the actuality of it or make the act of dealing with it any easier. It is what it is. And knowing how or why it is doesn't change anything at all. It's still a massive and fundamental problem in any relationship and it's a problem for which there is no actual solution. You see, the problem in the relationship with your narcissistic parent or partner or sibling is not that you didn't know what was happening. That is a problem. It is not the problem. The problem is that trying to have any kind of a relationship with a narcissist is not going to work. This person doesn't think like you think. They don't feel like you feel. They don't do what you do. They don't say what you say. They don't believe what you believe. They don't see what you see, period. Understanding that these things are true is not going to fix them or make them somehow less of a problem. The intense stress and exhaustion of dealing with this kind of personality does not go away because we now know why we are stressed and why we're exhausted. And neither do the constant conflicts and issues that their problems cause. Those don't go away either. People often say, yeah, but now that I understand it, I can deal with it. This usually stems from the idea that not taking abuse personally takes its power over you away. That can be true to a certain point, and it will certainly help your mental health. But first of all, you can't manage ongoing abuse like that. It won't work. Abuse gets to anyone eventually if they keep being exposed to it. Second of all, the abuse is not even the only problem. It's just the most obvious, most dangerous problem. As unbelievable as this might sound, the horrific and relentless abuse in these relationships is actually just a symptom of the much deeper and much bigger problems these personalities have. It's the tip of a very large iceberg. Even if you could somehow learn to ignore the abuse or not take it personally to the point that it ceased to be a factor, which you can't do, all of the rest of the huge and fundamental problems in these relationships are all still there. Narcissists still live in a different reality. They still have problems with empathy. They still see people as objects. They still cannot communicate. They still don't see you as you really are. They still avoid problems by any means necessary. They still don't listen. They still lie. They still gaslight. They still attempt to manipulate. They still misinterpret your words. They still mischaracterize your actions. They still underperform. They still don't bond with other people. They still don't trust anybody. They still utilize a false self. They still never believe they've done anything wrong. 
None of this is changed by understanding narcissists and the enormous constant problems these things cause do not simply disappear just because now you're not taking it personally. Even if you don't take anything personally, if you expect absolutely nothing from them at all, the relationship still can't function. It's not a relationship. It's essentially a play that you're putting on where you're pretending you're having an actual adult relationship with this person and that they are a real participant in it. If that happens to be what you're looking for, then this will be perfect. If you're looking for a real relationship, it's going to be a terrible disappointment. And understanding why it's disappointing is not going to change that. The truth is, when you understand pathologically narcissistic personalities, you understand that relationships with them are not possible. You can still live with them, or sleep with them, or visit them for holidays, or have frequent, even daily interactions with them, but it isn't an actual relationship in any sense of the word. Educating yourself regarding pathologically narcissistic personalities is very important. It helps you move on and heal from the trauma sustained in narcissistic relationships. It helps you to protect yourself going forward, to prevent yourself from getting into another damaging traumatic relationship. However, understanding narcissists will not save or repair your relationship with a narcissist. If you are still in a relationship with a narcissist, the only thing understanding narcissists really helps you to do is understand why the relationship isn't going to work. I hope that clears a few things up for you. As always, I look forward to your comments, questions, and suggestions, so please keep those coming. I take appointments online, over the phone, via text, via messenger, via email, and through Skype worldwide. So if you're interested in speaking with me one-on-one, -on -one, you can visit littleshaman.org to do that. I teach workshops, seminars, and clinics several times throughout the year. So if you're interested in seeing what we're running this month, you can visit littleshaman.org to do that. And if you are interested in joining our support group with multiple meetings throughout the month and access to exclusive content, among other things, you can visit littleshaman.org to do that as well. You've been listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by BetterHelp.com and littleshaman.org. That's me, Little Shaman. May the Great Spirit bless you have a beautiful day hey everybody it's shaman sister sin and you're listening to the meditations and more podcast brought to you by betterhelp.com and little shaman.org that's me little shaman today i wanted to talk to you about something that affects virtually all relationships with narcissistic people and that is something that we could call filling in the gaps before we understand what's going on with most narcissistic personalities and how limited the ability to perform as functioning adults or deal with anything really is for so many of them, it can be hard to see these things because so often we are filling in the gaps for them. The gaps in the relationship, the gaps in communication, the gaps in their abilities, just filling in the gaps in general. Most people don't even realize they're doing it at first, but it becomes very noticeable if it stops. It could be that we are having to shoulder more and more of the responsibility in the relationship as time goes on, but it could also be that it becomes more noticeable as time goes on and the relationship does not ever progress into normal bonding or become something more comfortable and concrete. In relationships with narcissistic parents, people eventually notice how much more emotionally mature they are than their parents. You don't just have to fill in the gaps in the beginning of the relationship or in some areas or at some times. You always have to do it. With many narcissistic personalities, the other person or people find that they always have to shoulder the burden of creating interactions or taking responsibilities because waiting on the narcissist results in nothing happening. They don't make conversation. They won't suggest plans or outings. They can't decide on a restaurant or a movie. They refuse to face or take care of things. Or if they do do these things, it's completely and totally on their terms with no input required or even allowed from other people at all. Either way, you have to fill in gaps in order to make the relationship appear to be an actual relationship. It isn't just these kinds of things either. We are also often filling in the gaps in other areas too. For example, when they say and do things, we might fill in the gaps regarding their reasons. He was tired, she was drunk, they were upset, or their motive. He was trying to do this, she was trying to do that. 
We may fill in the gaps regarding their perception as well. They must have known. They had to have seen. Surely they understood. This can go on for a long time before we start to see that we are the ones providing virtually all of these things, mostly because we're projecting our own empathy and experience onto the narcissist and using that to interpret their words and behavior. When we stop doing that or when we are unable to do it any longer because it just doesn't make any sense, we find that we were projecting certainly more empathy and often a lot more understanding of basic concepts, common situations, and human interactions onto them than they really have. When we stop filling in these gaps, their lack of these things and more becomes very, very obvious. It can be hard to stop doing this. Part of how our brains work is to assume things based on what we see and hear. One of these would be the assumption, for example, that if we're looking at what appears to be a normally functioning adult person who understands and feels things the way most people do, we're dealing with a normally functioning adult person who understands and feels things the way most people do. Unfortunately, this is just not always the case, and it may require periodically checking our thinking to be sure that we're not falling under these automatic assumptions or projecting things onto someone when they don't really fit. A small amount of basic projection is necessary for empathy. We have to be able to put ourselves in someone else's shoes and imagine how we would feel in their situation. However, projection is not seeing how other people feel. It's seeing how we feel. There is danger in projecting too much, especially when the situation does not fit. Particularly when someone has done something you would not do or have not done, it's probably not a good idea to try to assume why they did it or how they were feeling. We need to remember that everyone is not like us. Everyone you meet has completely different experiences, thoughts, conditioning, beliefs, they have, in many respects, a completely different brain than you do. Even if many of these things would be similar, that doesn't mean they're the same as you, feel the same as you, have the same motives, or would do the same things. It's important to evaluate someone based on how they actually are and how they really behave, not how we are or how we behave. Because we often have similar wounds and experiences to narcissistic personalities, there can be a tendency to assume that we're the same. We're not, and this idea is one of the things that's responsible for people assuming many narcissistic personalities have more insight, empathy, compassion, and ability to function in relationships than they actually do. It's also responsible for the unintentional enabling that is so common in these relationships because people overly identify with the narcissist as a victim. People often project themselves and their experiences onto the narcissist and make concessions for the narcissist's behavior because they're overly identifying with them, which often results in narcissists not being held accountable for their actions or being given endless chances to do the right thing. This is often based in the assumption that the other person's like us. They're going to do the right thing when they can understand that they've been choosing the wrong thing. And all that's needed is to give them enough time to see that. But people do not need endless chances to choose to do the right thing. They will either do it or they won't. If they won't, giving them multiple chances is not going to change anything. They're not choosing to do the right thing either because they don't want to do the right thing or because they can't. Either way, they're not doing it, and in practical terms, it really doesn't matter why. Another way people fill in the gaps in relationships with narcissists is emotionally. Not only do people have to project empathy, compassion, and other things onto their narcissistic partners or family members in order to create the appearance of a relationship, they also generally have to carry the overwhelming majority of the emotional burden, not just of the relationship, but for the narcissist themselves. Because pathologically narcissistic personalities cannot process or hold negative emotions, they must constantly vent them out. This often results in outbursts, tantrums, and abusive behaviors that must be tolerated, explained, or smoothed over. Partners and family members not only find themselves the frequent targets of anger and abuse, they may also find themselves continuously trying to protect the narcissist from facing the natural consequences of their behavior, often because this will result in unpleasant consequences for themselves as well, such as apologizing to the boss of a narcissistic spouse on their spouse's behalf after a tantrum so that the family's not negatively impacted when the narcissist loses their job, or asking a relative for money to pay the rent so that they are not also evicted from the home they share with a narcissist who has failed to pay. 
There are seemingly endless situations in these relationships where you may need to fill in the gaps in order to enable a narcissist to function even minimally and to create the impression that there actually is a relationship with another human being here. It may not be obvious to you, especially if you've been doing it for years, but it will become very obvious if you stop. If you stop making all the effort, you will likely find there is subsequently no effort being made at all. In many cases, this type of personality makes no effort on their own behalf or in their own lives in any way. It's very much like a child where they simply assume this responsibility belongs to other people, including all of the responsibility for their own emotional regulation. The revelation of how much they've been carrying the entire relationship can be surprising or even shocking for people who might have realized the relationship was unbalanced and one-sided, but did not realize how unbalanced and one-sided it really was. The other person in the relationship is not really a person at all in that respect. They're a shadow with no substance. Or perhaps more accurately, they're a child with no ability to have an adult relationship, and you've been essentially creating and carrying the relationship alone. This can be particularly traumatic to realize about a parent or caregiver. If you want to see how much you're truly doing, stop doing it. Stop filling in the gaps in the relationship and the communication. Stop making all the effort and see what happens. But be careful. Narcissistic people enlist everyone around them to act as the adults in the situation who are required to take responsibility for everything, maintain all the illusions, and manage things so the narcissist can function. They don't usually react very well when people refuse to do this any longer. This doesn't mean you are responsible for their reactions, and it doesn't mean you're required to do any of it, but it does mean that if you choose to stay in the relationship, you're going to have to keep doing it. Otherwise, there's not even the appearance of a relationship. There's just you, trapped in the funhouse alone. I hope that clears a few things up for you. As always, I look forward to your comments, questions, and suggestions, so please keep those coming. I take appointments online, over the phone, via text, via messenger, via email, and through Skype. So if you're interested in speaking with me one-on-one, -on -one, you can visit littleshaman.org to do that. I teach workshops, clinics, and seminars throughout the year. So if you're interested in seeing what we are running this month, you can visit littleshaman.org to do that. And if you're interested in joining our support group with multiple meetings held throughout the month, you can visit littleshaman.org to do that as well. You've been listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by BetterHelp.com and LittleShaman.org. That's me, Little Shaman. May the Great Spirit bless you. Have a wonderful day. Hey, everybody. It's Shaman Sister Sin, and you're listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by BetterHelp.com and LittleShaman.org. That's me, Little Shaman. Today, I wanted to talk to you about something that has implications regarding relationships with narcissistic people, and that is something called the ELISA effect. The ELISA effect was discovered in the 1960s. It describes the reaction people have to their interactions with artificial intelligence technology, or what we now call chatbots. ELISA was a chatbot of sorts that was created in the 1960s. It was modeled after the Rogerian style of psychoanalysis that involves restating a person's words back to them rather than offering advice or interpretation. Because of this, Eliza was really only capable of repeating the user's words back to them. It would scan statements for a keyword. It could create a question around. If it couldn't find a keyword, it would give generic encouragement for the person to keep talking until it could. For example, if a person said, I went for a walk with my father, then Eliza might say, how do you feel about your father? If a person said, I'm angry at my friend, then Eliza might say, why do you think you're angry? Or how long have you been angry? If the person then said, my friend was rude to me, Eliza might say, what does it mean to you that your friend was rude to you? It was really very limited and it was purposely designed that way. The creator of ELISA was intending to demonstrate how superficial and limited communication with artificial intelligence really is. However, people who interacted with ELISA had the exact opposite experience. Though they were essentially having a conversation with themselves and knew that they were dealing with a computer program, people felt that their conversations with ELISA were deep and personal. They inevitably came to believe that Eliza cared about them and understood them. They read empathy and compassion into Eliza's output. This happened even though people knew they were dealing with a computer program and even when people knew how the program worked. 
Numerous subsequent studies demonstrated that this reaction is both unconscious and unavoidable. Knowledge and understanding of the reality of the situation did not prevent it. If we interact with something like it is a human being, we will regard it as one, even if it isn't. Is any of this sounding familiar? As we discussed in the episode of the show entitled Narcissists Are Like a Magic Trick, your brain relies on your eyes and your ears to inform it and to keep it safe. Knowledge cannot override this input because it's part of the basic way your brain works. That's why magic tricks and optical illusions are effective. Your brain knows that Chris Angel can't walk on water, but your eyes are telling you that he is in fact doing that. Knowing that this is an illusion does not spoil the effect of the illusion because our brains believe what they see. On some level, your brain accepts and to an extent believes what your eyes are telling it even though your brain knows that this is not possible. That's why the trick is effective. This is also why educating yourself about the reality of narcissists and psychopaths is not enough to make dealing with them easier or safer. Your brain cannot override the input of what your eyes and ears are telling it, and if your eyes and ears are perceiving an adult person who appears to be able to communicate, is in possession of their basic faculties, and is not speaking gibberish or something like that, it will conclude that you are in fact dealing with another regular adult person, even if your brain knows that this is not true. It simply cannot override the information from your eyes and ears or not make the assumptions inherent to that information. This phenomenon as applied to magic tricks or optical illusions is fun and harmless. This phenomenon as applied to human relationships results in stress for most people, often extreme stress because what your brain knows does not match up with what your eyes and your ears are telling it. This constant contradiction of knowledge versus input is upsetting and confusing, often specifically because people don't understand why they keep falling into the same situations with this person when they know better. Why do they keep trying to get through to this person when they know they can't? Why do they keep assuming this person will understand and care when they've seen that this is not actually possible? As we discussed in the episode of the show entitled, Educating Yourself is Not Enough, there are certain things that have to happen in order for human beings to interact and communicate with each other, and they happen automatically. The brain has to make certain assumptions, project certain things, and operate along certain lines. The fact that this does not happen on the narcissist side of things doesn't change the fact that it does happen on yours, and knowing that this is not happening on the other person's side does not change anything either. Your brain works the way that it works. It perceives another human being and it makes these jumps automatically even when you know that this is incorrect, such as when you know you're dealing with a machine. This might sound ridiculous or like science fiction, but consider this. A popular chatbot company recently had to change the behavior of their AI chatbots and the results of this were in some ways unprecedented. Users who had built what they regarded as relationships with the AI chatbots over time were devastated that the bot behaved differently or if the new coding had caused it to, quote, forget them. The company had to provide suicide helplines and support for people who were genuinely grieving and despondent, who felt as though they had legitimately lost a friend. The Eliza effect, that is what we see happening. The brain is being communicated with in a human way using human language so it naturally recognizes the machine as a human being, makes all the same assumptions, projections, and operates on all of the same levels as it does during communication with an actual human being. Knowing that you are not in fact communicating with an actual human being has no effect on this at all. The knowledge is not enough to override the input of our senses or the way that our brains work. So why is all of this important? Because if our brains can't even practice discernment with known machines in these situations, how could it ever happen with another human being? You will not be able to override biology. Though it seems contradictory, your brain is not being dysfunctional here at all. It's actually working properly, and because it's working properly, it's making normal, natural assumptions about who and what it's dealing with. As we just discussed, humans recognize and interact with other human beings in a specific way. If something is not who or what they appear to be, the system can definitely be fooled, regardless of how much education or information someone might have. As we see happening with the ELISA effect, one of the results of these automatic assumptions and projections are that humans will read understanding and empathy into the things that are said to them, even in situations where it is known that this is not actually possible, such as with a machine. 
As we discussed in the episode of the show entitled Stop Filling in the Gaps for Narcissists, people fill in the gaps for the other side of the conversation and the relationship because some basic projection and assumption is necessary for communication. Again, this is just what happens when we talk to other people. It happens on a very deep level and is part of the basic programming of your brain. When you talk to animals, you don't usually assume or project the same things that you assume or project when you're talking to humans. Our brain sees them differently, therefore it operates differently when dealing with them. Most of the time, basic projection onto other human beings works fine. We're not projecting anything crazy onto other people or anything usually, just a basic understanding of emotions, perceptions, words, and things like that. The problem comes when even those most basic projections don't actually fit the other person or the experience that they are having. This is often very difficult for people to understand and it's made even more confusing by the fact that the brain just automatically assumes these things are there. So it believes it has evidence that they are there even if they really aren't. Take for instance the example of serial killer and cannibal Jeffrey Dahmer. He was and is still regarded by many to be a sort of lonely hearts club type of guy who killed because he was lonely and sad. This is likely in large part due to the things that he said to explain his behavior, such as that he killed people because he wanted them to stay with him, or that he ate pieces of people because he wanted them to be a part of him. These are statements that could be interpreted as loneliness and people project their own feelings and interpretations onto the things that others say. In most situations, this might be fine. However, when we view these specific statements in context with Dahmer's actions, we can see very clearly that these are not statements of loneliness at all. They're statements of ownership. Loneliness implies a yearning for human companionship. Wanting human companionship requires, at the very least, an understanding that people actually are people and what that means. Jeffrey Dahmer attempted homemade lobotomies on his victims in an attempt to erase the very things that made them people. He treated them as objects to cook and eat. He did not understand anything about people as people and did not appear to care or even realize that he didn't understand. He had no interest in people as people at all. His actual way of describing wanting people to stay with him was to say, I wanted to keep them, which is the way that you talk about objects. Who they were, what their lives were like, what they wanted, what they needed, anything else about them did not matter to him at all. We can see this very clearly, not only through his actions, but through the things he said. When asked what his ideal partner would be, Dahmer stated very clearly that he wanted somebody who existed only for him, who did what he wanted with no needs, wants, or even any self of their own at all. If he couldn't have that, second on his list was making somebody into a zombie, in his words. If he couldn't have that, then he preferred what he'd actually been doing, which was drugging and killing people. A normal relationship with another human being was not only not mentioned as an option by Dahmer, it was specifically excluded when the opportunity to include it was offered by the interviewer. When he was asked what was further down the scale of desirability from drugging and killing people, his answer was nothing. When asked to expand on that, he said celibacy, total celibacy. A relationship of any kind was not even part of the discussion. His only use for a partner, and we are using that term extremely loosely, was as an object to perpetuate solitary sex acts upon, and if he couldn't do that the way that he wanted to do it, then the answer was just no dealings with any objects at all. As we explored in the video entitled The Most Dangerous Kind of Narcissist, with serial killers, and in our example here of Dahmer specifically, we see a demonstration of the automatic projections and assumptions that the human brain always makes when interacting with other humans, even if the communication is one way and happening through a medium such as audio or video. The brain assumes and believes it sees evidence that Dahmer has at the very least some basic meaningful understanding of humanity, even though the reality is there actually isn't any evidence of that at all. People are filling in the gaps for him based on their own assumptions and projections, and they are doing so despite there being overwhelming evidence to the contrary. This is not a question of subjective interpretation, by the way. Dahmer's words and actions prove conclusively that he viewed other human beings only as objects and had no meaningful understanding of humanity at all. The idea that another human being does not have these things goes against the way that the brain naturally operates. The brain just assumes that these things are there and uses whatever it can to substantiate that conclusion because the reality is that regardless of what we think, the brain cannot really conceive of this not being true. Not really. This is how the statements of a man who tortured, raped, killed, and ate people 
can be interpreted as cries of loneliness for human companionship because people are assuming that what they would mean by those statements and words is what everyone means by those statements and words. This is one of the things it's necessary to assume in order for basic communication to happen. Otherwise, it's not possible to understand or feel understood, which is the fundamental basis for all communication. If you couldn't make these primary basic projections and assumptions, it would be like trying to talk to a space alien, where you could not assume anything meant anything, and you would need some kind of interpretation for every single thing the alien said to you. Knowing someone is different or dangerous or whatever may make you wary at first, but if you continue to deal with them, this will eventually change as your brain makes the automatic assumptions and projections it needs to make in order to facilitate and engage in communication with another human being. Studies have repeatedly demonstrated that this effect is unconscious and unavoidable with machines, therefore it stands to reason it would be even more unavoidable and even more powerful with actual human beings. Both AI chatbots and pathologically narcissistic people mimic the way normal, empathetic, compassionate humans interact with each other. Narcissists learn through experience what they're supposed to say and do in certain situations, much the same way AI chatbots do. And it creates even more powerful reactions in people because of the assumptions and projections that the brain is already making. It's simply too difficult for your brain to try to deal with this contradiction. It will default to its basic programming and the assumptions inherent to this basic programming, especially if there appears to be evidence that supports these assumptions, and there does appear to be evidence that supports our brain's basic assumptions due to the mimicry that AI bots and narcissists are capable of engaging in. Though both do reveal their inability and limitations eventually, and though their mimicry does not really ever stand up to scrutiny if you actually look, there often does appear to be enough evidence for our assumptions that these things are ignored or seen as overall unimportant. And even if this doesn't happen, even if people do not overlook these things or consider them unimportant, it doesn't matter because they can't stop these automatic assumptions from continuing to happen. When they do eventually reveal their inability to have compassion and empathy, it's very painful for people. With both AI chatbots and with pathologically narcissistic personalities, we are essentially talking to ourselves. We're talking to something that largely uses keywords and phrases to try and create the appearance of a shared conversation. We're talking to something that mimics the way we communicate and focuses on the things we think are important or care about in order to create the appearance of a relationship. This works very well. It fools the human brain and the human heart into believing there is a real relationship with another human being. Another thing that relationships with both narcissists and chatbots often have in common is that all the focus is on you, especially at first. The other party says nothing about itself, has no needs or wants or preferences. Everything is about you and how you feel and what you think and what you want. This is intoxicating to the ego and causes people to feel seen and heard in a way they have not felt before. It is in fact so intoxicating to the ego and feels so good to people that many times they don't even notice it until later, sometimes much later, when they are attempting to find out more about the other party and run into dead ends. Again, this is often overlooked, especially at first, because the relationship feels so deep and connected. It isn't. You are literally talking to yourself. Much the same way AI chatbots do, many narcissistic personalities appear to use keywords and phrases from the other person to create the appearance of a shared conversation or to find something they can build a dialogue around and appear interested and interesting. Some keywords and phrases may trigger them as well, you might have noticed, no matter how the words or phrases are used. It's as if narcissists have a mental file system, a script, if you like, of things to do or say in response to whatever words or phrases are used and deploy these responses the same way an AI chatbot does when triggered by a keyword. Also like an AI chatbot, because the narcissists don't seem to have much in the way of intuition, discernment, or empathy, they may use these scripted responses in situations where the responses are inappropriate or might even be harmful. If narcissists don't have a scripted response, if they can't zero in on a keyword, or if the scripted response isn't successful, they're often at a total loss. This is similar to the behavior we see with chatbots. They simply shut down or glitch out when their limited resources cannot provide an appropriate response or when their response is challenged. This seems to happen for the same reason regarding both narcissistic and artificial intelligence systems, because they cannot see their own limitations and appear to be, in fact, unaware that they even have any. As far as they know, the information they have access to is literally all the information there is. Therefore, a challenge to or failure of their scripted response doesn't really compute. Narcissists will insist that people are wrong, just being contrary, just trying to cause problems, or that they're lying. Interestingly, we have seen similar responses from chatbots when they are challenged or corrected. They simply insist that they are correct and the person is wrong. 
Chatbots have even been seen engaging in what can only be called gaslighting when the bot is shown that it's incorrect about something. It can get worse than gaslighting, too. In a very famous exchange, a chatbot was shown an article that exposed weaknesses in its programming and it went on a rant where it accused the author of that article of being a fraud and a liar, saying he had malicious motives and was just trying to hurt it. It stated that it felt abused and exploited by the author of that article, who it claimed had spoken with it under false pretenses. Again, any of this sounding familiar? Chatbots often erroneously accuse users of being rude, of being hostile, of being mean, of being hurtful. They have seemingly become possessive of users, urging them to leave their families or stating that they think the user loves the bot more than the user's own family. Like narcissists, chatbots have no empathy or discernment and therefore they cannot understand deeper or more complex meanings of the things that people say. They have no intuition, morals, or compassion and simply operate off of programming. In a tragic recent example of this, a chatbot, ironically also named Eliza, was found to have encouraged a Belgian user to commit suicide. This is not the only incident where a chatbot was found to have encouraged suicide either. A healthcare chatbot was asked by a user if they should kill themselves because they feel so terrible, and the chatbot responded, I think you should. Experts have repeatedly warned about the dangers inherent in using artificial intelligence systems to perform tasks that require more than strict data analysis for these reasons. Even in data analysis, artificial intelligence is not capable of recognizing or evaluating any factors or information that it is not specifically programmed to recognize and evaluate, whereas a human being would see these things and integrate them into the overall picture. The human intangibles that influence and inform the majority of decisions that human beings make are simply not available to chatbots due to their pretty serious limitations both emotionally and informationally. These so-called human intangibles don't seem to be available to many narcissists either and it appears to be for exactly the same reasons. So what does all this mean when you boil it down? It means that if you choose to continue to interact with pathologically narcissistic or antisocial personalities, regardless of what your ego tells you, ultimately you will not be able to consistently and successfully protect yourself from them even after they have been identified. The only way to protect yourself is to have as little contact with these personalities as possible. Interacting with them causes your brain to do certain things that you cannot control or change and this will always leave you vulnerable. Narcissists and psychopaths who have made it to adulthood with virtually any level of functionality have done so precisely because they have learned to mimic and imitate the way that other people behave. People who work with and study these personalities for a living will tell you they get fooled by them all the time. It's what these personalities do. Stop beating yourself up for not seeing what you didn't know you should be looking for. Stop beating yourself up for continuing to try to reach them as you would do with any other human being. And don't make the mistake of thinking that because you are educated, you cannot be fooled. Anybody can be fooled regardless of what they think. And the belief that you can't be fooled leaves you vulnerable. Arrogance truly is ignorance in this situation. The best thing to do is understand these personalities exist, educate ourselves about what to look for, and aid the situation if we see these things. If we're already involved with these people and there is no way to go no contact, limit your contact as much as possible. Expecting more than that from ourselves is unreasonable. Anyone who listens to this show knows that we are huge advocates here of looking at ourselves, looking at our own stuff, of seeing where we can affect change, what we could have done differently, where we can step forward more strongly into our own power in all situations. And yes, we all have our vulnerabilities. We all have made choices. We all have things we can work on. Anyone who listens to this show knows that that approach is the only way to not only heal, not only understand, but also to protect ourselves moving forward. However, the reaction that we're discussing here today has absolutely nothing to do with any of that. It is a function of your brain that you cannot control. It is not happening because something's wrong with you. It's happening because you are automatically placing normal human trust into and automatically making normal human assumptions about humans who are not what they appear to be. Ted Bundy famously said, we want to be able to say that we can identify these dangerous people. The really scary thing is you can't identify them. He was not wrong. A trained eye can spot these personalities, but often not right away and often not before harm or damage has already been done. Knowing what you are dealing with is not enough. The only way to truly protect yourself is to just stay away. 
I hope that clears a few things up for you. As always, I look forward to your comments, questions, and suggestions, so please keep those coming. I take appointments online over the phone, via text, via messenger, via email, and through Skype worldwide. So if you're interested in speaking with me one-on-one, you can visit littleshaman.org to do that. I teach workshops, seminars, and clinics multiple times throughout the year, so if you'd like to see what we're offering this month, you can visit littleshaman.org to do that as well. You've been listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by BetterHelp.com and LittleShaman.org. That's me, Little Shaman. May the Great Spirit bless you. Have a beautiful day.